Pacific Coastal Landscapes Initiative. Let's, in addition to myself, um, you're going to be hearing from Amy Mead and Sean Banks today. Uh, both of them are with the North Carolina Cooperative Extension. Amy is a natural resource agent covering New Hanover, Brunswick, and Pinner counties, and Sean is an agriculture and horticulture agent uh, for Carteret County. Um, and since we have such a large group today, we're not going to be able to see and hear from everyone, so uh, please keep your microphones and your video off. Um, however, if you are a landscape contractor um, you're, and you're seeking continuing education credits, um, then we, you will need to keep your video on. And um, also, please uh, enter your license number into the chat um, at the start and the end of this event. Um, that's down at the bottom of the screen. Um, and you can see, you can send that directly to me if you want, if you don't want to send it to everybody. So we're scheduled for one hour and we'll have some time at the end for questions. Um, our speakers and some of our partners have also agreed to be available for questions um, after that one hour period. So we'll stay on until um, at least 1045. Um, please use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen to submit the questions. And you also have the opportunity to upvote um, and that helps us, if you see a question that you also wanna have answered, that'll help us prioritize uh, which ones to respond to. Uh, Christy Perrin, a colleague of mine here at uh, North Carolina Sea Grant is gonna help us with questions at the end. Um, and there at the very end of the uh, event, there an evaluation is um, gonna pop up on your screen. Please take a few minutes to respond to that, um, to give us some feedback. <clears throat> and um, we may also uh, work in one poll. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we have over 450 people that were registered for today, and it looks like about half, well, well half of, are, are actually uh, signed in already. Um, but you all, uh, the people are, uh, live as far north as Duck and as far south as Sunset Beach and as far inland as New Bern and uh, Fayetteville. We uh, have also a good number of uh, home gardeners signed up, as well as some landscape contractors, a few designers, and, uh, and, and even a few retail nurseries. Um, uh, there are also a few people that signed up in the other category uh, that, that I, and I failed to include on the form um, uh, uh, space for you to identify what your other category is. So if you could, uh, if you remember, selecting that option. If you would drop in the chat who you actually are so we have a better idea of who we reach, that would be that would be helpful. So our goals today are uh, several. Uh, first is to help you identify the bad actor plants to avoid purchasing or accepting from your well-meaning friends or neighbors. Um, to introduce you to some of the native coastal plants that make some really excellent uh, landscaping choices to help you talk with your neighbors and your clients and also your friends about why you're making the specific plant choices you are and to acquaint you uh, with the Coastal Landscapes Initiative. So I'm gonna get started with the last two items and then Amy and Sean will be a tag team addressing uh, the first two items. I also wanted to mention, if you don't have the question and answer uh, option on your, uh, on your version of Zoom, then just put your question in the chat. So our natural uh, landscapes continue to drastically change, um, like you see here. Um, this is an area that's been impacted by past and new development, by storms, and also from rising sea levels. So the Coastal Landscapes Initiative was started uh, to find ways to promote and support landscaping practices at various scales. Uh, uh, practices that not only meet our human needs and our desires, but, but also protect and enhance our coastal resources. Uh, resources like water quality, or fisheries, and wildlife habitat. So there are many things we can do to mitigate our impacts, uh, some of which are just a little bit different than what we've done in the past. And here is a list of the types of landscape uh, practices that can make a difference. Um, we're not going to be able to go over these today, but we do have a recorded, because of time, uh, but we do have a recorded webinar on our CLI website uh, that covers some of these practices if you're interested. Um, please go and visit that and we'll share our, uh, we'll share our URL later. Um, but for, day, for today, um, we're going to focus, we're going to focus on the plants. So North Carolina Sea Grant coordinates the Coastal Landscapes Initiative, um, but we really rely on others um, for their coastal landscaping expertise. Uh, 
my background is in biology, fisheries, and environmental management. So uh, we really need others to help us understand some of the other, uh, some of the landscaping nuances. The partners of the Coastal Landscapes Initiative are from uh, universities, state agencies, nonprofit organizations, and from businesses. And the organizations whose logos you see um, that just popped up at the bottom of the slide uh, have been particularly important partners for the Coastal Landscape Initiative um, and for the content of today's program. So we thank them. And I also want to take a little bit of time today to give some special recognition to these three women. Um, they are uh, conservation horticulturists with our uh, great North Carolina uh, aquariums. Um, Kathy Mitchell, Frida Pyron, and Rachel Veal um, have been part of the original team for our Plant This Instead publication uh, that Amy is going to tell you about a little bit later. Um, but they sat with me on monthly uh, Zoom meetings for over two, year, two, two years. Um, uh, it took that long to identify some nine, uh, 19 uh, bad actor plants and their substitutes um, that are actually featured in that document. Um, but these women have contributed enormously to all of our CLI products and efforts, and uh, we would thank the aquariums and them um, for their participation. Kathy and Rachel, uh, well, actually, I think all three of them are going to be around for the question and answer session um, at the end, and also Carol Peoples with the uh, North Carolina Native Plant Society, who has been helping with the effort, um, and obviously Sean and Amy. So what are bad actor plants? Um, well, here is one of them uh, that's covering a lob lolly pine. Uh, this image is real. Um, it's not altered. Um, I know because I took it about five years ago. Um, it's in my Raleigh neighborhood. This is an invasive ornamental wisteria. It's either wisteria sinensis or wisteria floribunda. I'm not sure which. Um, and it was probably likely planted because someone wanted its purple leaves. You can see the purple uh, uh, purple flowers, sorry. Um, the, the flowers, actually, you can see them right now. I saw them as I was driving, in, driving into work. Um, also, as an aside, I want to encourage you to learn and use botanical names of plants. Um, it's okay if you mispronounce them. I do it all the time, but it's really the only way to learn the plants. And when you go into nurseries, uh, make sure that you are getting what you're going after. Um, so this is also an invasive vine at the coast. Uh, the tree that it's on is uh, dead now. Uh, and in fact, all the trees you can see, you can see a little bit in the back and all over in here. This is a little natural area by a stormwater pond. All the vegetation there has now dead. Um, because this is a sprawling invasive plant um, has just taken over. Um, native vines don't really act like this. They, don't, they are not this aggressive. Um, they're not invasive like this. So invasive, line, invasive vines um, are particularly bad for tree and shrub health um, because they hold in unwanted moisture and makes it easier for diseases to flourish. They also cover the leaves that prevent uh, plants from producing their own food. Uh, they deplete nutrients from the surrounding soil. Um, and you know, they cover other plants. Uh, this vine uh, in particular has covered all the low growing plants. So basically invasive plants uh, take over the areas where they escape to and they reduce both the plant and animal diversity. They, uh, in essence, simplify the system. Uh, an invasive plant this. An invasive plant is, uh, so these are the characteristics or the definition, um, if they are non-native to a specified area or region. Uh, obviously they come from somewhere, but they, uh, in the specific area they are in, um, they can uh, are introduced by humans either intentionally or unintentionally. Today we're talking about ornamental uh, plants uh, and they spread beyond where they were planted uh, to cause harm, either environmental harm that leads to loss of biodiversity or economic harm. Uh, and controlling invasive species is, uh, is uh, very expensive. So my journey with landscaping began uh, in earnest about 18 years ago when I bought my current property. I think with most people, uh, that's when we start to learn about plants. It's when we have our own property to, uh, to think about how, how we're gonna manage it. 
Uh, so this is a view of my backyard taken a few weeks ago. Um, I think I'm the third owner. Uh, this was landscaped in the 60s. Uh, I will tell you that I made a huge mistake when I first moved in and I cut down a lot of pine um, and sweet gums uh, in this area. And I lost my uh, free source of pine straw. And I also lost the shade that those trees provided on the west side of my house during the summer. Uh, and the microclimate clearly disappeared. Um, and the sense of place that I had, this loblolly pines are well known um, throughout the state and particularly in the Piedmont. Um, but the biggest challenge really that I've had uh, is uh, controlling bad actor or uh, invasive plants. Uh, these are the same type of plants, as I mentioned, that, uh, that you see at the coast. Uh, the picture that I showed you of the wisteria is on the other side of the pond over here. Um, but in this corner of my property, uh, I also have wisteria. It's come over from a couple of properties over and um, I've tried to control it myself, um, but it's, uh, it's, it really wants to live. So it's, and, and I can't take care of it. So I'm gonna have to get somebody to come in and help me. Uh, English ivy has been another problem plant uh, for me, uh, it has taken over this area of my yard. Um, and I, there were, and this ivy was covering uh, in my entire backyard uh, when I moved in. Uh, the previous owners had got to the point where they couldn't keep it under control. Um, I did, and now I can't, uh, and now I can't anymore. Um, what I find is that the ivy will come back from the smallest little bit of uh, root that's left. And when it gets high in the trees, it also produces seeds. Um, and uh, I, I can't get out and clean it except for only in the winter uh, when I don't think that the copperheads are out and, and might get me as well. So um, I also, in this, in this area, for some reason my laser is off in this area, of the yard. I also have periwinkle. And in the front of my yard, uh, coming in from my neighbors, I have English ivy and a little bit of privet. So I'm certainly very familiar with invasive plants and, and they're, they're difficult enough for me. But uh, what they also have done is they have reduced the quality and the extent of the habitat, these small pockets of habitat that we have um, in this highly urbanized area. So picking up where I left off. So these are some of the uh, traits that allow non-native plants to become invasive. Um, they produce a lot of seeds uh, and these seeds spread easily and they, and these, and they have high generation, uh, they have high germination rates. So they will, able, they will be able to grow. Uh, and pl these invasive plants also tolerate different growing conditions. Um, many of them can grow in shade as well as sun. This allows them to invade even the interior of forests, uh, some of them, not all of them, but some of them. And they are generally um, have few diseases and predators. And as I mentioned before, and as you saw from some of the examples, they grow uh, vigorously. So switching gears a little bit, I also wanted to mention that uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency's eco-regions um, these are areas in the state that have, uh, or in the country really, that have similar living and non-living components. They're based on geology, landforms, soils, vegetation, climate, wildlife, and hydrology. So they take a lot of things into consideration. But there are four levels that get progressively more refined. This happens to be a level uh, three. And uh, there are 104 of these regions um, in the continental United States. If we go in closer to uh, uh, view uh, North Carolina, uh, we can see that uh, we are in what they call the Middle Atlantic Coastal Plain. It basically goes up to the James River in Virginia and down to uh, Charleston uh, Bay in South Carolina. Um, and the typically uh, our, this coastal area is, has flat and poorly drained land. And as you know, we have humid summers and pretty temperate winters. Um, and we can go even one step four more into level four, level four, excuse me, take a sip of water. 
And we can see that we have even more distinct areas. Uh, we have barrier islands, um, we have floodplains along our rivers, we have uh, uh, swamps and peatlands in Northeast North Carolina and uh, pine savannas in the, in the Southeast. And I really show you this to illustrate that we have pockets of diverse ecosystems at the coast and each has its own distinct set of plants. Um, the plants that are naturally found here are what we call native to the area. So we call them native plants. So these are some of the habitats and animals, you know, the real life, not just on a map um, that we have in North Carolina. Um, what I, I like to think of these systems uh, uh, that's plants being the base of an ecosystem. Uh, the type of soil and the amount of water and the temperature are really the primary determinants of the type of plant that can live in an area. And the type of plants that determine the kind of, it's the type of the plants that are there that determine the kind of animals that can exist. So in other words, uh, native plants are naturally adapted to the local soil and climate conditions. Uh, these plants co-evolve with other species in the area. Uh, some of these plants have highly specialized relationships with animals and they work as a system. So here are a couple of examples. Um, the image on the left is a cedar waxwing um, and it's on an Eastern red cedar. Um, Eastern red cedar is actually Juniperus virginiana. So it's not a cedar at all. It's, uh, it's a juniper, which is why it's important to know the scientific name. Um, but red cedars, uh, so red cedars are very common on barrier islands and they're adapted to the conditions there. Uh, they're adapted to soil and salt aerosols and drought. And waxwing depends on the cedar for food and the cedar uh, depends on the waxwing for seed dispersal. Sorry, I'm having a little problem with my... Uh, in the middle picture here, we have a uh, Gulf fritillary butterfly. Uh, it has to uh, lay its eggs on passiflora, uh, plants, gene, plants in the passiflora genus, like think passiflora incarnata, uh, the passion flower, uh, because it's butterfly, uh, relies on this plant uh, for its food. And uh, we need caterpillars uh, to feed the birds and the butterflies themselves are important uh, for pollinating, for pollinating uh, plants in the Asteraceae family. So in the end, I guess I hope, I hope that you walk away uh, understanding if you didn't already, um, that our plant choices do make a difference and can bring us not only beauty in our, on our property, but support our communities. Um, so uh, now I'm going to turn this over to Amy and Sean so they can tell you specifically about some of the excellent plant choices that you can make um, and some of the specific ones uh, that you can avoid. All right. Thanks, Gloria, so much for setting us up here. Um, Sean and I are going to continue the presentation here, and we're really going to dig down into um, uh, you know, specific plants that are bad actors in, uh, in our urban yards, and then um, what plants we can replace those with. A lot of the plants that we're going to talk about today are not plants that maybe you planted intentionally, but a lot of these were really darlings of the um, landscaping trade for many years, and um, you know, and some of this is perpetuated by people saying, like, oh, that's growing in my neighbor's yard. I really want to plant something like pampas grass. It doesn't look, look so tropical. Um, but there are, you know, uh, we're going to talk about the issues related to some of these bad actors, and then um, really how important some of these native um, alternatives are. Um, not just that they're well adapted. But just as Gloria said, how important they are as a foundation for wildlife and that a part of that system that she talked about. Um, uh, Sean and I are gonna switch off. It's Sean Banks, he's from uh, Carteret County. And so we're gonna give you really two different perspectives. I'm down here in the Southeast corner of North Carolina in Brunswick, Pender and New Hanover counties. Um, and Sean is up in Carteret County, just at the base of the Outer Banks. So even in that short distance, we see climate, um, climate uh, differences and um, differences in habitat. So 
uh, even just the two of us talking, we see um, differences in things and how aggressive they are or things that do uh, better in, in different um, uh, climate changes and um, conditions as well. So let's get started. And you know, uh, y'all are on mute, but you can boo and hiss when you see this one, the calorie pair. We're gonna start off with what we can, yeah, I see Christy, boo. Um, you know, this has certainly become the poster child for plants that we thought were great and uh, turned out to be a real nuisance and uh, have become very invasive. So the calorie pair, this is Pyrus calori caloriana, um, specifically the cultivar here, Bradford. Um, these, you can see these calorie pairs in bloom right now. These are the one, these are ones at the Brunswick County government complex. Um, these, were, these were bred to be sterile, um, but what we have found uh, is that they have escaped cultivation. Um, and as they do that in two ways. Um, Bradford pears can't crossbreed with one another, but they can crossbreed with other cultivars and other pear species. Uh, what they can also do is that the Bradford pears are all grafted onto regular um, pear rootstock. So that rootstock can also oh. sprout at the um, sucker at the base, and then it can crossbreed with those flowers. Um, so, it, you know, this is a poster child of, you know, good intentions, things that were meant to be sterile, um, and now they've escaped. I love this word malodorous because, um, you know, while it is a, a beautiful blooming, spring blooming tree, I have heard the blooms described as um, rotting fish or urine, not something that I wanna have in my yard. Um, and to me, one of the worst things is its oral structural shape. Um, and we'll see pictures of that here in a second. Um, but here's calorie pairs. Uh, Gloria sent these pictures of calorie pair volunteers on NC State's Centennial Campus. Um, and so you can see this is a great time to be able to see um, invasive plants in action. So we'll often see these blooming along roadsides in disturbed areas. And that's where a lot of these um, invasive plants really get a foothold in these, inv um, in these disturbed um, uh, places. Um, so you can see these in bloom right now. Here's my least favorite thing about um, Bradford pears is they have a terrible um, structural shape. Um, these plants, these trees usually have a co-dominant stems uh, where you see the um, uh, stems coming together like this. Uh, this makes them very weak structurally. And this goes to this resilience, this idea of, um, you know, we want to plant things. We are very prone to wind storms. We sometimes have ice storms. These trees will split um, in these circumstances, and then you get um, trees that look like this, uh, ugly, poor shape. Um, they are just simply not resilient in our um, coastal environments. And there are so many better choices. So, um, but I wanna say, if you do have a, a Bradford pear, um, there is the, um, oops, the um, NC Urban Forest Council has been instituting this in many municipalities, the NC Bradford Pear Bounty, I know it's coming to Wilmington sometime soon, Wilmington area, um, but they, uh, and it might come to your uh, neighborhood sometime soon, but if you remove one of these and show them proof, they will provide you with a new um, native tree to replace that. So um, check out and see if that might be available in your area. A Couple of different options for uh, replacements for this. If you really want to um, fill that specimen uh, tree niche and you really want something that's gonna have a bloom on it, you might wanna consider service berry. Um, this is a smaller tree, 15 to 25 feet at maturity. Um, it can be single stemmed or multi stemmed, but it's gonna have that you know, lovely um, uh, bloom to it. Um, flowering best in part sun, part shade. Um, and it is tolerant of wet soils and somewhat tolerant of salt spray. So a lot of the plants we're gonna talk about are very adaptable um, or drought tolerant. Um, and a lot of them are gonna be salt spray tolerant, which is really important when you're living close to the, um, to the ocean. Um, but huge wildlife value for this plant. Um, you know, it's got these flowers early in the spring uh, or in the spring for um, pollinators followed by fruits for the birds. And this plant is a host plant for the butterflies like this one, the red spotted purple. It's a beautiful butterfly I got to see for the first time in Brunswick County. Beautiful, dark, velvety, black and blue butterfly. Another tree that is really gonna be a beautiful specimen tree for you is the American fringe tree. This is Cyananthus virginicus. 
I think this looks like cotton candy when it's in bloom. It's got these lovely fluttery um, blooms um, that blooms in the late spring, needs part shade to full sun. Um, it's got these um, uh, uh, fruits that follow the flowers. Uh, 2016, Audubon named this the bird friendly native plant of the year. So a great tree for your yard. One more beautiful specimen tree, the Eastern red bud. Um, this uh, beautiful uh, one here on the right is rising sun as the cultivar. This is planted at the New Hanover County Arboretum and just stunning, beautiful spring color. Um, the, lots of different cultivars of red buds. Um, they can be up to 30 feet tall, depending on that cultivar. These spring blooming trees are really important for uh, providing that early source of nectar for pollinators. Um, it's got seeds for songbirds. Um, just interesting little fact about um, red buds. If you ever see these little half moon cutouts on the leaves, that is the work of a leaf cutter bee. This is a favorite nesting material for those cavity nesting native bees. Um, and you might see those also, they love petunia flowers if you have those in containers. If you see little heart, uh, half moon cutouts, that's the work of leaf cutter bees. They line their cavity nests with that and create little chambers for their larva. But listen, these are all specimen trees. These are smaller trees, but if you are removing a Bradford pear, I want, to, I want you to consider replanting with a canopy tree. Um, if, you know, Bradford pears are really big trees. So if you've lost one or you're removing one, uh, you can't do any better than planting an oak. Um, uh, most of you are here because you have been reading about this or, or, or are interested in this subject. The wildlife value of oaks cannot be overstated. They are absolutely the bedrock uh, you know, of, of wildlife. Um, the Schumard oak is a great choice. Uh, I have live oaks in my yard, but I know that not everybody has space for that. A Schumard oak might be a better uh, fit for you. Uh, you know, 50 feet tall at maturity, it's going to be a little narrower crown uh, to it, only about 40 feet wide at maturity. Um, very tolerant of urban conditions. We're seeing this being planted in um, new communities. It's wind and flood resistant. Uh, that goes back to that resiliency. Beautiful fall color. And uh, the Quercus genus, uh, this is Quercus schumardii, uh, but the Quercus genus is host plant for hundreds of moth and butterfly caterpillars. Last count I saw was 897 for North America, uh, depend on these, specifically on the vegetation from uh, Quercus genus to complete their life cycle. Here's a picture of Quercus schumardii, the schumard oak in a new development. Uh, what I really like about this uh, tree is that um, it has this beautiful fall color, which is something that we don't always get to hear um, at the coast. Um, but yeah, the, I really was I'm pretty impressed. This is a development across from my house. Um, and they had planted these Schumard oaks, they planted river birch and bald cypress, great choices for a new urban development. Here's a great example of a, a beautiful moth that is, um, uses oaks as its host plant. This is an imperial moth. It uses all of these um, native trees um, from the Quercus or Oaks genus, Acers, which is maples, Pinus genus, which is pines. This is liquid amber, styraciflua, that sweet gum. Uh, so, uh, you know, don't uh, like it. Gloria regrets cutting down her sweet gums, but they are great host plants for a lot of moth and butterfly caterpillars and sassafras as well. John? So the, the first plant that the, the next plant that we have on our don't plant this list is the Chinese towel tree or sometimes called the popcorn tree. Scientific name is Triadica sabifera and it's often used as a shade tree in the landscape and can be a real pain because the seeds of this tree are spread by birds and they can be deposited just about anywhere. And since this tree can grow in very dry conditions or along water's edge, the seeds have the potential to grow just about anywhere. Um, it doesn't mind crowded conditions, so it may grow in thick clumps, um, and that will shade out all of the native plants that are growing in that area. The fruit and the leaves are toxic to humans and cattle, and the leaves are very high in tannins, which alter the soil chemistry to prevent other plants from growing alongside them. So this plant is so invasive, it's listed as a noxious weed in Florida, 
and invasive in Arkansas, California, Oklahoma, Texas, Georgia, and here in North Carolina. Uh, next, <clears throat> we have um, plants that can be used to replace the Chinese tallow tree in the landscape. The first one is the, the red maple or acerubrum. It's a good alternative as a shade tree in the, the landscape um, because the, it's the first one to bloom in the winter with large clusters of red flowers all over the tree. And the blooms develop into samaras, or as I used to call them, helicopters that spin their way down to the ground when they mature later on in the summer. It's a moderately fast growing tree, especially in irrigated lawns or in areas where the soil stays moist. And what it is most known for is the brilliant orange to red foliage in the fall that creates such a fabulous display of color. There are many different cultivars to choose from like October Glory and Brandywine. And it's also the host plant for um, caterpillars of many different moths and butterflies, including the rosy maple moth, which is pictured here on this slide. The next plant on the list is the red mulberry or Morris rubra. And so the, the red mulberry is another small to medium sized tree in the landscape and it is a good substitute because there, there is a song that uh, about the mulberry tree that I learned when I was growing up and that makes this tree a part of my childhood history. Um, you may have also learned the song as well. I'll spare you the, the singing of the song. So the leaves are unique um, in that they may have one to three lobes or they may be heart shaped with no lobes. This characteristic makes this an easy tree to identify your, when you're walking through the woods. The fruit, which appears in the summer after tiny flowers in the spring, can be one to one and a quarter inches long, resembling a blackberry. The fruit is very sweet and it makes great jams, jellies, and juices. Um, birds will eat the fruit as well, spreading the seeds far and wide. But if the fruit drops to the ground, it may produce new trees in the spring if the fruit is not cleaned up. So the next tree that we may want to consider as an alternative is the, a flowering dogwood. Um, could be called Bentha Media Florida or Cornus Florida. Um, the flower, flowering dogwood is a small tree in the landscape and it's a good alternative because the, as you can see in the photo here, the, the showy large colored bracts, in this case white, but they could be pink or red, um, uh, have a great show or produce a great show in the, the landscape. Um, and then the, uh, they usually bloom around Easter time each year, making quite a show. And then the, the little yellow flowers in the center uh, attract a number of specialized bees and butterflies that come to the nectar and pollen. Following the flowers, the red fruits develop by late summer or into the fall and provide food for a number of different songbirds through the cold winter months. The deep reds and oranges of, of the leaves make for a beautiful fall color display. And when the leaves have all dropped, the blocky bark adds winter interest to the garden. It's also the host to the spring azure butterfly. Amy? So our next tree that you may see in your neighborhood, and I, I love to tell the story that a friend of mine, uh, she lives in downtown Wilmington, and she said, oh, I'm thinking about getting a new tree. I love these mimosa trees that my neighbors have. And I, I, had, to, I had to tell her that, um, that oh, with those, those trees, they probably didn't, or one person planted them, and the rest of them have probably popped over over time. So um, the mimosa tree is, you know, we see these, they seed themselves very, very easily. Um, either by wind or by animals. Um, they have a very tropical look, so I think that's why people are attracted to them, but uh, they really um, outcompete native plants. You can see here on the bottom, that's a picture of mimosa trees growing on the roadside. Um, they can form dense uh, canopies uh, that shade out other native plants. The other things that just make this a bad tree, weak limbs, um, uh, it, it's a messy tree and then it drops uh, seed pods and the debris from the flowers. Um, and the other thing is that just like the um, tallow tree, this is toxic to livestock. So when this, these plants do become invasive and they pop up in um, uh, pa uh, pasture areas, they, they can be toxic to the um, livestock and cattle. So some alternatives um, to uh, the mimosa tree, if you want kind of an impactful specimen, 
uh, shrub or tree. Um, the red buckeye, absolutely beautiful. We have one planted here um, at the um, New Hanover County Arboretum in our native plant garden, um, and it's really showy. A small tree or large shrub can be 15 to 25 feet at maturity. You can see this one in the picture here has been limbed up a little bit into a small tree. But what's beautiful about it is these clusters of red flowers in the spring that are really attractive to pollinators, especially hummingbirds. Um, anytime you have red tubular flowers on plants, you're, that's always going to be attractive to hummingbirds. Um, uh, it's got followed by seeds for wildlife, really works well with other plants. It's not gonna shade things out or crowd out other plants. Um, it's a pretty well behaved plant in the landscape. I, I can't recommend this plant enough. This is a sweet bay magnolia. And if people are saying, I'm looking for a tree for, uh, I need a smaller tree for my yard. This is my go-to. Um, magnolia virginiana. This is a smaller species um, than the magnolia grandiflora that we, we always think of. It's only gonna be about 20 feet tall. It likes full sun. It can be, again, single-stemmed or multi-stemmed. That is a single stem variety here, or, or um, uh, trained to be a single stem. Um, it's got um, fragrant flowers. They're smaller than the grandiflora, um, and it's, that's followed by fruits. But the thing that I like about this, it's, it's pretty drought tolerant once it's established, but it can also be grown in uh, wet sites. I have one planted in a rain garden. Um, moderately salt tolerant. Um, and these plants are host, host plants for a lot of different butterflies, including this, the spice bush swallowtail. Beautiful butterfly. I love to see these butterflies uh, in my garden. Um, this is uh, another plant that you might consider as an alternative. Uh, I told Sean, I thought this sounded like um, a kid named this, the sparkleberry. Um, but this is Vexinium arboreum. Um, this is a small tree or a large shrub, again, 10 to 20 uh, feet at maturity. It may be deciduous or evergreen, depending on uh, the climate it's planted in. Um, and this sounds like my backyard. Prefers rocky or sandy soils. I have pure sand, so I need plants that can tolerate pure sand. Heat and drought tolerant, uh, followed by black fruit in the winter for wildlife. Um, these kinds of, this vaccinium and these kinds of um, uh, plants that have these bell-shaped flowers, really attractive to our native bees, such as this one the, um, up in the corner, the blueberry bee. Um, this is a blueberry bee on specifically blue blueberry flowers, um, but they look for those um, bell-shaped flowers like that. Um, go ahead, Sean. Okay, so the next plant on the don't plant this list is actually two different kinds of two different plants that are very closely related. Um, they're often used as foundation plants or as hedges. Um, these are both privet or ligustrum. Um, they're ligustrum japonicum and ligustrum sinensis. Ligustrum japonicum is the picture in the top. Ligustrum sinensis is in the bottom right. And both of these ligustrums are considered invasive in North Carolina and should not be planted because it spreads by the, the birds that eat the seeds and then drop them in odd places. And then once they, the seeds drop, it's a fast growing plant that doesn't mind growing in tight quarters. So it often develops dense thickets that shade out other native plants and can be very invasive. It's very adaptable to a wide range of conditions. So it could pop up just about anywhere in natural areas and usually does. Um, so the next plant um, on the, our list to replace the Ligustrum sinensis is the inkberry holly or Ilex glabra. Um, inkberry holly makes a, a great substitute either as a foundation plant or as a hedge um, in our area because it's a evergreen with small leaves that has a compact rounded habit when it's young. Um, it can reach heights of five to 10 feet tall at maturity and can be pruned to the just about any shape that is desired. It tolerates a wide range of soils and environmental conditions although it's often found in the wild in sandy woods or on the edge of swampy bogs. Um, the white spring flowers attract a number of different pollinators and the blackberries are eaten through the winter time by a variety of wildlife. It's also the host of the Henry's elf and butterfly, which is also pictured on this slide. The next alternative is another plant that flowers in early summer and can make a good hedge and this is Virginia sweet spire or Itea virginica. 
Virginia sweet spire is a nice plant in the landscape because the long terminal racemes of white fragrant flowers appear in early summer or late spring. And this plant grows best in part shade to part sun and produ produces its best flower set when it receives about four hours of sunlight each day. Because of the extensive root system, this plant works well to help control erosion. The cultivar Henry's Garnet is most likely what you will find in the, the garden center. And if you have, if you've had issues with Phytophthora root rot, this plant is resistant to that disease. And so you can have problems there. The next plant that uh, would make a good alternative is the um, wax myrtle or Myrica serifera or Morella serifera. And the wax myrtle can make an excellent alternative as a hedge or as a screening plant. This uh, evergreen shrub is a small tree um, and it's tolerant of a wide variety of soils, moisture condition, and salt spray. Because of its extensive fibrous root system, it can be used for a plant to control erosion as well. Its uh, dense branches make great cover for birds, which have a, a ready source of berries in the fall and winter. Warblers in particular are attracted to this plant. Um, and this plant also fixes atmospheric nitrogen, which helps us to survive being in poor soils. So on the next slide, we see pictures depicting this plant in a couple of different forms. On the, the left, we see wax myrtle prone to a, a formal hedge, um, makes it very dense. You can't see through it very well. And then on the right, we can see where the wax myrtle was pruned up to be a, a small tree in the landscape and planted it along this roadside to give the appearance of a, a tree-lined street. Um, so it can be very versatile in the landscape and makes a great alternative. Amy? All right, here's another uh, bad actor, um, the thorny olive. Uh, this is Eliagnus pungens. Um, this is considered invasive in North Carolina. Um, it's uh, reasonably easy to identify. Um, we can see these um, alternate leaves um, with these brown underside of the leaves that are pretty um, easy to identify. The other thing that um, you can spot right away is it has these long um, shoots that trail out above the plant. So it gives it kind of an unkempt look. The thing that makes this plant so aggressive and invasive is that these stems have thorns that can hook up onto other plants and structures. So in, in essence, it almost becomes a vining plant and because it's able to climb its way up onto other things. Um, all of the species of Eliagnus are considered invasive. Um, that includes Russian olive and autumn olive as well. But uh, so a lot of times people planted these in order to be screens or hedges, but there are a lot of really great alternatives. Um, hands down, I love hollies. I, I, all of the hollies, uh, native hollies do really well. Very drought tolerant, very well adapted to urban conditions. This is the Yapon holly, Ilex vomitoria. Um, you can see here, this one's um, limbed up into a kind of a tree size. A lot of times they're really just a very full um, uh, shrub, um, but they do have a small uh, flowers, very attractive to a variety of pollinators. Um, and uh, these, these plants um, are dioecious, so they have male and female flowers on separate plants. Only the female plants will produce the red berries. But those berries are a really important um, source of food for songbirds in the winter. And also, they just really are very beautiful as well. Um, there is a dwarf cultivar, Ilex vomitoria nana. Um, this is in front of the Brunswick County um, uh, Cooperative Extension Office here. Um, it's a great uh, uh, choice for foundations or for a more formal look. It really, really requires no pruning and grows in this um, very rounded shape. Another choice, uh, and, and you might not think of it as a um, screening plant, but I really encourage you to plant a Southern Magnolia. Um, this is Magnolia grandiflora. I mean, the regular, you know, straight Magnolia grandiflora is a really big tree, you know, 60 80 feet tall, um, but there are a lot of cultivars that might fit your landscape. Um, but this is, you know, beautiful, fragrant flowers. The seeds are, you know, these interesting seed pods and the seeds are eaten by birds and small mammals. And the thing I love about these trees, they are highly wind tolerant. All of these plants is so important for us to think about resilience in the landscape and the face of 
climate change and um, you know increased intensity of storms and hurricanes that are coming. Um, these trees also super uh, tolerant of urban conditions and salt spray. Um, like I said, there's lots of uh, cultivars out there. This uh, particular one here on the right is a teddy bear magnolia. Teddy bear is a trademark name. The um, actual um, cultivar name is Southern Charm. This one is at full, full size, um, full maturity. That's about 20 feet tall. Um, there's also K Paris or Little Gem that are smaller cultivars and will be under 30 feet at maturity. Um, we love this tree down here and it's blooming right now. This is the Carolina cherry laurel, Prunus caroliniana. Um, this is an evergreen shrub to small tree, grows about 20 to 30 feet tall. I have one in my own yard that the birds planted and it masqueraded as part of a hedge until it popped out the top and said, oh, we're just getting on a tree. And I said, welcome. Um, but these can, you know, you can allow these to become a tree, but you can also prune these into a hedge or screen. Um, they prefer the full sun. Um, in the early spring, pollinators love these trees. It will be loaded with blooms and loaded with pollinators. Um, that's followed by fruits in the late summer that are eaten by birds. I can attest to you that mockingbirds especially love this. And um, I think that's why I see them sprouting all over the place in my yard. Um, the Prunus genus, uh, this is a really important host plant. Um, it is the host plant, uh, Prunus species are host plant for over 450 species of moths and butterflies, including this one. If you love to see Eastern tiger swallowtails in your yard, plant yourself um, a Carolina cherry laurel. I just wanna put in a quick note, which is if you are thinking about creating a foundation or a, a screen, um, we want to move away from these monolithic uh, monotype hedges of the same plants. Uh, for one thing, it, it allows disease to carry from plant to plant, but we're also not um, providing diversity and biodiversity in those hedges. Um, I really want to turn you on if you have not seen the Coastal Landscapes Initiative landscaping design templates, which I'll give you the um, link for at the end. Um, fabulous resource. Um, this is an example of a um, landscape template for foundation. Um, we can see it suggests inkberry, holly, dwarf yaupon, and American beautyberry. So it's a, a good mix of um, uh, deciduous and evergreen plants. It, you know, because oftentimes I know what plants to plant, but what, how is it going to look good together? What, um, you know, how should I plant them? How many do I need? Um, it also gives you alternatives and some other um, perennials that you can grow. Lots of great um, uh, templates available to you. Okay, so Japanese barberry or Berberis thumbergii is the, the next plant on our don't plant list. And this goes right along with the, the hedges of, of single plants all the way along. Um, so it's often planted as a foundation plant or as a hedge in the landscape, either for its color, colorful foliage or because of the spines um, that keep the, the people away. And the reason it should be avoided is that birds eat this, these beautiful red berries and then they drop the seeds just about everywhere. Um, then the seeds will germinate readily and they can destroy the, the native habitats. Uh, this plant is also very tolerant of our extreme, oh, it's not very tolerant of our extreme heat and it dislikes wet soils. So right here on the coast might not do very well anyway. But my personal opinion is that we don't need another plant with thorns, spines, or prickles growing in our in growing wild in our woods and, and natural areas for us to just run into as we go for our walks. So the next plant that is a good alternative is the uh, blueberry or Vicinium species. Um, blueberries, while not super color, colorful or spiny, make an excellent alternative because it has a great show of white um, bell-shaped flowers early in the spring, probably blooming right now, um, or at least they are in my area. And they are a great source of early nectar for many of the different native pollinators that we have. The dark blue or purple berries ripen in the summer and it's edible to both humans and wildlife. And it makes a wonderful muffin. So um, it has a, a brilliant call follow, fall color filled with um, yellows and oranges. 
and it's a host plant for the brown elf and butterfly. Okay, so the next plant that's on our list of, of alternatives is the Adam's needle or yucca filamentosa. Um, Adam's needle is a good choice as a barrier plant because it's drought tolerant in our ever-changing environment and it will grow in full sun or part shade. In nature, you will find this one in woodlands, forests, um, on the dunes or on the roadsides in, in disturbed areas. Uh, in late spring, it has a large panicle of white fragrant flowers that stands tall above the evergreen foliage, as you can see in that picture down in the bottom. And the thick pointy leaves um, keep people from walking through it and make it resistant to deer and rabbits. It's also tolerant of poor soils, salt spray, and heat. So the, the next plant on our our don't our, on our replacement list is the winterberry holly or Ilex verticillata, and winterberry is winterberry holly is another good choice because if you plant a male and a female plant, the female plant will be loaded with the showy red berries when the leaves drop in the fall. <clears throat> Just for your information, it takes one male plant to pollinate ten to twenty female plants. So you can plant one that's not gonna have berries for every 10 to 20 female plants that will have berries. And then the berries will persist in the fall when the plant drops its leaves and provide food for birds and small mammals through the winter. Um, the plant is tolerant of heat, drought, soil compaction, deer, fire, and salt. Um, however, you need to note that in drought conditions, the plant may abort the berries to conserve moisture. Amy? So here's another one that we've been hearing a lot about. This is Nandina, Nandina domestica, also called heavenly bamboo. This is listed as invasive in North Carolina and we do definitely see this popping up in natural areas. Um, it's uh, seeds are spread, uh, spread by um, birds or by rhizomes or a plant is spread by rhizomes as well and it can create dense thickets. Um, what's really important to me about this plant is the leaves and the berries are cyanide producing and can be fatal to birds when eaten in large quantities. There's a great um, uh, article uh, from the North Carolina Botanical Garden because I, I really wanted to see the research that's behind this and, and they did research on the leaves and the berries and asked the question, are these really fatal to birds? And the answer is yes to specific birds. Um, if some birds eat, eat one berry of this, um, their, their bodies can detoxify that, but specifically birds like the cedar waxwing that go and gorge on berries, they go and they'll strip a whole bush, their bodies don't have enough time to detoxify that cyanide, um, and so we have seen deaths of cedar waxwings. A good tip is if you do have one of these in your landscape and you are not ready to remove it or replace it, um, just cut the berries off. That's the least you can do. Uh, but if you're ready to replace it, um, or if you want an alternative to this, we've got great alternatives. Um, American Beauty Berry, absolutely one of my favorite deciduous shrubs, three to eight feet tall. Um, it's got these, uh, you know, inconspicuous little pink flowers along the stem, followed by these vivid purple berries, which you can enjoy for a little while, and then the birds will absolutely come and devour them. Um, an interesting fact about this, uh, the leaves contain a compound called calicarpinol, which is being researched as a possible mosquito repellent. And if you crush the leaves and rub it on your skin, it will actually repel um, mosquitoes. Be careful when buying this plant at um, a nursery, make sure you're looking for calicarpa americana. We're seeing things um, marketed as beauty berry and they are a non-native beauty berry. So, and that the ones that are non-native are smaller and they have this spreading habitat. Um, so uh, be cautious and um, be a good um, uh, consumer. Another plant that I love is um, dwarf palmetto. This is sable minor, uh, two to five feet tall, very drought tolerant, has a, um, a tap root to it, moderately salt tolerant. It's gonna give you really interesting texture um, and an evergreen uh, in your landscape. Um, it's got flowers for pollinators and uh, berries for birds and mammals. This is a plant, um, this is another plant that uh, I'm actually interested in getting into my yard. This is New Jersey tea, which I don't have yet. Ceanthus americanus, um, deciduous low growing shrub, three feet tall, five feet wide, a little taller than it is, or wider than it is tall. 
but I like this, prefers sandy loam to rocky soils in full sun. So this sounds like a plant for me. Fragrant clusters of flowers in the early summer, really attractive to bees, moths, predatory wasps, drought tolerant. And this is, this is why a lot of these plants are drought tolerant. They have really deep root systems um, and they can help with erosion control. Um, and this is a host plant for summer azores. Okay, so next on our don't plant this is the, the maiden grass or miscanthus grass. I just saw a question pop up in the, the question and answer section about grasses. And maybe this section will help answer some of those questions as well. Um, so grasses have become very popular in the landscape, probably because of the the wispy leaves that create movement in the landscape and because of their unique seed heads. Um, depending on the mature size of the plant, they may be planted as specimen plants, as hedges, or maybe just in masses. And there are several different cultivars of miscanthus available in the trade. However, it can be a problem when it escapes cultivation. Um, seeds can be spread great distances on the wind. And once it becomes established in a location, it's very difficult to eradicate. Um, it is considered weedy and invasive and will often become established along the roadside or in disturbed areas in the landscape. Um, some native alternatives include this next plant, which is the, the molly grass. Um, and so molly grass can be as, as tall as, well, may not be as tall as some of the other grasses. It only gets to be about two to four feet tall. It makes an excellent alternative because it is resistant to deer. Um, and if that's not enough, it's tolerant of heat, humidity, drought, poor soils, and it's highly salt tolerant. And when planted in masses, it's uh, fine textured leaves and stunning pink plumes of flowers, flowering panicles create a stunning fall color display. The next native grass can be a bit taller. It's the coastal switchgrass or panicum. Amerum um, and coastal switchgrass can be an excellent alternative because it grows native on dunes and poor soils, um, sandy soils, making it drought and salt tolerant. It's uh, a clumping grass that can be used as a soil stabilizer on the dunes or along sandy waterways. With a height of two to five feet, it can also be used as a tall hedge or a low screening plant. And we don't often think of grasses as host plants for caterpillars, but this one can be the host plant for common wood nymph and several different skipper butterflies. The next grass on the list is little blue stem or Schizocarium scoparium. Um, the little blue stem, also called prairie, prairie beard grass, makes an excellent alternative. Um, once it's established, this two to four foot tall plant um, is very drought tolerant. It's also tolerant of a wide range of conditions, including sandy soils, clay soils, wet or dry soils, poor soils, and also salt spray. Um, and so during the, the growing season, the stems and leaves may have a, a bluish cast to them, which gives way to a coppery color in the fall and winter months. And this is another great plant for soil erosion control. And it's also a host plant for a variety of different butterfly and caterpillar, or butterfly and moth caterpillars. Amy? Uh, forgive us, we know we're going a little bit over here, but uh, we, are, we are bringing it home here. Um, uh, we'll end here with talking about um, a couple of um, ground covers. This is one of uh, our bad actors here, periwinkle. This is specifically the vinca minor, the both vinca minor and vinca major are considered invasive species. Um, these are dense mat forming ground covers and it, you know, I see why they're attractive, but we love a bloom, don't we? Um, but these spread as nodes come in contact with the soil. And um, I like this little quote down here, Vinca is like Eng English ivy's devious little cousin. Um, so we can see it forms these dense mats here. Some um, good alternatives. Um, this is green and gold or Chrysogonum virginianum. Um, uh, this is a uh, low growing perennial. Uh, this is the um, uh, one you'll most commonly see is a little mounding form to it. Um, it. This really prefers being in the shade in woodland gardens, um, but very attractive yellow flowers. Um, this is a cultivar called Eco Lacquered Spider that we have at the Arboretum. I actually am very fond of it. It has, it's a very um, prostrate um, 
it's prostrate version uh, has these um, stolons that um, that run across the ground. Um, I've seen this available uh, for for a pretty penny at um, Plant Delights. Um, this is a creeping sedge as an alternative ground cover. Uh, this is specifically Carex uh, laxicolmus. Um, this reminds me a lot of um, a dwarf mondo grass, so a good alternative to that semi-evergreen uh, to evergreen um, clumping. Um, it will spread slowly over time. This particular species prefers um, wetter sites and partial shade. There are really a lot of species of Carex to fit your, um, your site conditions. Um, this is a host plant for satyr butterfly larva. Last one, a kind of an off the wall suggestion, but we're seeing this bloom right now is Carolina jessamine, um, Gelsemium semper virens. Uh, very drought tolerant, um, tolerant of a lot of different soil conditions as well, likes full sun. But interestingly, if it is unsupported, it will grow into a bushy ground cover like you see uh, down here. Can also be grown on a slope to control erosion. Very attractive to butterflies and native bees. Um, but just a very good thing to note that all parts of the plant are toxic if ingested by humans. Okay, so we wanted to end with a couple of demonstration gardens. Um, that have been put in in the last little bit. Um, this one is a, a demonstration garden that was put together with by North Carolina Sea Grant, where they worked with uh, Kingswood Elementary School in Wake County to improve the ecological function of the campus. The teachers wanted to increase the, the number of, of wildlife that came, so they wanted to see more birds, more butterflies. And while they were doing a, a survey of the area, they noticed that um, there was a, a plant there that was very toxic to birds. That's the Nandina that's in the front of that picture on the left-hand side. Um, and so this area was replanted with several different native plants and it became about 85% native plants that were installed in there. The photo on the right is a picture of the master gardeners that were visiting the site after it had been replanted and, and become established. On the next slide is a, a list of the different plants that were used in this um, site. You've got the Itea, the golden twig dogwood. You've got a switchgrass, molly grass, and also a, a witch hazel that were put in there to attract more, more wildlife, the birds, the butterflies, um, and the bees that, that would come to the, the area. Amy? Last one, uh, just very quickly, this is a demonstration site um, in Surf City. This is um, up in Pender County. Um, this is on a barrier island, so uh, the DOT had put in a new bridge and a new roundabout, very beautiful entrance to Surf City, but the first thing that you saw was the back side of this gas station here. Um, so the Surf City um, Town Beautification Committee uh, wanted some help to create a visual screen, but it really needed to be drought tolerant because uh, there's no irrigation in this area, very compacted soil. Um, so we chose um, native plants, especially plants. I always tell people, look outside your window. What is, whatever is growing there naturally, if you're living on a barrier island, you're going to see eastern red cedars, you're going to see palmettos, you're going to see yapon hollies. All of these are going to be really well adapted to the conditions there on that um, barrier island. So if you've been furiously scribbling notes, I will tell you that all of these plants and more suggestions are available in this fabulous new publication by NCC Grant. Um, this is Plant This Instead. Uh, you can see the link there on the bottom. I always just type in Coastal Landscapes Initiative, uh, you know, Sea Grant, and uh, the, um, you'll find all of the um, things that they have. So you'll see, um, uh, you know, screening plant or, um, you know, uh, screening plants like English Ivy and then alternatives for those. And then they'll have even more alternatives at the bottom. Um, just great information for all of those. If Again, if you are not familiar with the products of Sea Grant, they are fantastic and we use them every day. Um, this is, um, they have a, um, a booklet here with uh, great plant choices and a, a pamphlet for pocket guide. They've got wonderful videos online, their native plant picks um, that, to give you even more information. Here's that landscaping template that I described. I love this and it just can give you so many ideas and then how to implement that and how to analyze your yard um, and how to um, uh, make these changes and add these plants into your yard. So that's it for Sean and I. We'll turn it over to Gloria and any questions you guys may have. 
and oh well so there's Gloria's information and if you need to contact her first. yeah I, I'm gonna actually go to the q a um this is Christy with C Grant um so if you have to leave that's fine if you want to stick around and hear some of the answers to some of these questions that have been um raised in the q a we'll be here for another 10 minutes or so talking about these and I'm going to point out some of the ones that got a lot of discussion in the q a how do you know if a cultivar is good to plant, a cultivar of a native? And there's some chat that um, they're usually safe, but I'm gonna open it up to our experts here that are on, Amy, Sean, Carol, Rachel. Um, I, I could take a quick stab at that. Um, you know, straight varieties are probably the, the best choice. Um, but often they maybe won't fit in our landscape exactly. So, you know, uh, straight varieties, especially if you're doing native habitat uh, restoration. Um, but, you know, cultivars might be, uh, they're selected for size or, um, you know, things like that. What I want you to stay away from is making sure um, there is research that shows that if the color of the leaf has been altered, um, that they, that may be less valuable to um, uh, insects and um, uh, caterpillars. Um, if you see alteration of the flower or the flowering time, um, those are changes that you would want to avoid. So a good example that I always point to is um, um, uh, double petaled, um, uh, what are they called? Ru not rubecchia, the echinacea the um, purple cone flower. If you see those that have double flowers, uh, so there's no access to pollen or nectar for those, then they're losing their value. Um, a lot of times these cultivars are just chosen for um, their size and then maybe uh, they will fit better in the landscape. There is a concern again with um, the loss of biodiversity because these cultivars are clones of one another. Um, but um, you know, if you if this will make it more uh, easier for you to add them to your yard. Maybe you live in an HOA. Um, they might just be um, uh, a little easier to fit in your yard. I'll leave uh, Sean or Gloria if you had more to add to that. I think you covered it pretty well. Okay, great. Thank you, Amy. Another um, hot topic in the Q&A um, is um, dogwoods and red maples about how they may be susceptible to how they are susceptible to a couple different diseases particularly dogwoods were brought up a lot the cornus florida may florida may, um and also gloomy scale on red maples particularly in urban areas so yeah. i don't know if there's some comments about that yeah i'll, I'll make a comment on that um what i've seen with with red maples is that when they get stressed from not having enough water, and that's why I mentioned that in the, the slide set, um, it, they are usually found right alongside streams or boggy areas. So they're also called a, another common name is a swamp maple. They like to have wet roots. And so if they get in planted in a situation like in an island in a, um, a parking lot, then they're very dry and they don't usually get watered enough. So they get susceptible to the gloomy scale that comes in and feeds on it. And then it the gloomy scale, the weaker and the, the more stress the plant gets, the faster the gloomy scale can multiply. And so it becomes weaker and, and, and goes downhill faster and faster. The easiest way to overcome that is to give it enough water to where it's, it's not stressed. And if it's not stressed, then the gloomy scale won't be a problem. With the dogwoods, there's two different kinds of anthracnose. There's the spot anthracnose that usually affects the um, not the petals, but the bracts on the, the dogwood. Um, you'll also find the, the little red spots on the, the leaves as well. That's the spot anthracnose. And that's one that's, that's spread in the wind. And some years it's gonna be really bad. And some years you might not see very much of it at all. Uh, very rarely do I see dogwoods with spot anthracnose really bad two years in a row. I guess it could happen, but I haven't seen that. If the plant is planted in a, a location where it's um, not getting full sun all day long. So it's in a, a part shade environment, especially if it's getting shade in the afternoon, it's going to be less susceptible to those diseases. Um, dogwood anthracnose, I have not seen in this area. Maybe somebody else has, um, but dogwood anthracnose will get into the dogwood and it will kill the, the plant outright. But I have not seen that. Even the dogwoods that have died a lot lately 
have died because when we had that 35 inches of rain during um, Hurricane Florence, the ground stayed saturated for so long that the, the dogwood roots weren't able to get the, the oxygen they needed. And they suffered enough during that storm that it, it usually takes two to four years for the plant to completely um, completely die from that kind of damage. Mm -hmm. Anything else somebody else wants to add? Well, that was great. I will so, say, oh, go ahead, Gloria. No, go ahead. <clears throat> oh, just very quickly. I, I know people are afraid to replant dogwoods because we lost so many of them down here um, in the Southeast, but I've seen them under, I especially think they need to be understory trees. Um, they, they have beautiful ones planted. That picture that we showed of the dogwood is planted under longleaf pines on UNC Wilmington's campus. And they're very healthy and very happy. I think they just really need more shade. So both the red maple and the dogwood uh, are gonna be intolerant of planting in a very hot, dry, sunny place. They really need, oh, um, so that's that right plant, right place. Very, very important. Go ahead, Thank Gloria. You. Yeah, I was just going to uh, say that, you know, Kathy and Rachel, um, you know, if you're if you want to come off mute, I don't know if you have that capability where you're located, um, but if you want to come off mute and respond to a question, you can do that as well. Um, love to have your input. Uh, one, one other thing, I just going back to the cultivar versus native R versus straight species. Um, yeah, it really sort of depends on the plant. and. Uh, like Amy said, you know, it does seem like the, the petals, um, the, the petal structure and the leaf color are important. Um, the burgundy, are, um, are, you want to try to avoid those. And the other thing is, you know, think about berry production, like uh, dwarf yopon holly, as I understand, really doesn't have berries. So it's a nice plant. It can provide some structure for, uh, you know, nesting birds, but it doesn't provide the berries. So, you know, it kind of depends on the plant. Um, I know sometimes though that there are some I planted yeah. straight species of uh, grasses and they're great, but um, uh, well, actually they flopped a lot. So um, I, I would might want to go back to get a cultivar, um, a specific cultivar, but um, for uh, for uh, at least uh, one switchgrass that we use. Hey, Gloria, it's Rachel. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, um, to add to what Gloria said, I put a few things in the chat with some information. Um, for perennials, the cultivar question, it is always a big one every time I do the presentation. I um, Mount Pupus and I was doing a lot of trials to like kind of figure out like what are the wildlife benefits of these different cultivars. Um, so I put a link to that. But yeah, the main takeaway is like what, what are we bringing it for and does that reduce the wildlife value? What, you know, so things without berries, you know, that could be fine. Um, you know, that usually just means they're with the hollies that they're male. So they're still providing the pollen. But, you know, just kind of, if you like the plants with the um, non-green leaves, the burden leaves, they're not providing as many resources for caterpillars. So it's a little bit of a nuanced question because you kind of have to know what these wildlife is for them all. But there are a lot more resources. On, you know, people trying to do research to figure out like, Hey, we have these cultivars that are available in the trade. Like, what wildlife benefits are they providing? So, um, yeah, it does take a little more research. And if you can find the straight species, that's kind of easy. I want to check in with Christy too while she's here, um, because we we have a lot of questions. I had like a hiccup with my PowerPoint, and we can. I, it sounds like the uh, presenters and these other experts can stay on a little longer. So, I don't know, Christy, if you can stay on longer too. Yeah, we have people dropping off, but we still have people hanging. Yeah, on. yeah, and I'm happy to keep going through these Q and A's that were kind of high priority. If you'd like, great. That'd be great. yeah. Okay, so one another theme that was very common um, was how do I identify the native version of this versus the invasive version of this? So, for example, wisteria came up, mulberry. <laughs> grasses came up like particularly those that are in your that are already planted so is what I'm understanding these questions to mean rather than in a store where you can read the Latin name I think they're looking for in the field in the yard how do they identify Kathy let me um I have seen the American wisteria in garden centers where it was not identified as a native. 
Um, the floral, if it is in bloom, um, it tends to look more like a cluster of grapes, um, very rounded flower, flowering cluster, um, whereas the Asian wisterias are kind of like long and dangling, oh, you know, in general. But um, you can't always um, be sure that you're going to be seeing the botanical names at every garden center or have staff to who can um, let you know um, more about that. I also so. read somewhere, and Kat, Rachel, uh, Amy and Sean, maybe you can verify whether or not the, uh, the native cultivar, the, the native species uh, climbs uh, clockwise and the other one counterclockwise. Do you know if that's, <laughs> if that's true? I don't know. I'll have to look that I up. Heard we, have, that. we have an American wisteria here at the New Hanover County mm -hmm. Arboretum, and it's more like a shrub. Mm -hmm. It doesn't. It doesn't climb, or we don't let it. Climb. The, the American right. blooms after the leaves start coming out, whereas the other one does. That's the easiest way for me, and the mm -hmm. clusters are a lot smaller. So if it's that's why you really notice the using the series, you know, it's just purple and there's no leaves in the way of it for, you know, and mm -hmm. so it will kind of, when it's blooming now, there's usually not, it's not fully leafed out. Whereas usually the native one blooms in um, up here in the Outer Banks is May, usually late April, May. So it's a little bit later, mm -hmm. but I mean, that's going to vary. Also the most commonly available American wisteria um, is a cultivar that you'll find in nurseries and garden centers. It's Amethyst Falls. So, you know. Um, the, the one thing I wanted to point out is that I'm looking at the, the plant toolbox. Um, that's plants.ces.ncsu.edu. And looking at the, the American Wisteria, it does say on here that the American Wisteria twines counterclockwise whereas the other ones will, will twine clockwise. That's wild. That's, That's pretty cool. wild. <laughs> um, okay. well, Christy, I think, I think part of the question too was how, how can I identify my plants in my yard yes. too? Mm -hmm. And you. I will say, um, Sean just hit it. Um, we use the NC's, NCSU plant toolbox all the time. At literally every plant that I want to look up, I'll type in American Wisteria, and I'll put NCSU, and the plant toolbox will be the first thing that comes up. Lots of information on there, lots of pictures. I also, I know probably a lot of you use um, things like iNaturalist or um, and any other suggestion. I use iNaturalist quite a lot to um, identify plants if I don't know what they are. There are a lot of plant identification apps that you can use. Um, I would just like, definitely encourage you to be curious, take pictures and try and um, it'll get you started in the right direction to help identify those plants. Great, I was gonna mention iNaturalist too, cause oh, like when I'm out, out in my yard and have my phone, I click a few pictures, usually more than one picture. They ask you to click a picture and then um, the more pictures you take, the more accurate the response is likely to likely to be on that. Um, and then also um, grasses, same thing, I guess, using those resources to look up to see what grasses are needed. Grasses are tough. Yeah, grasses are tough. Yeah, that's on my next year's to-do list, figure out <laughs> how to identify grasses better. They can be tough. Um, okay, on to the next. Another really, really hot topic is where do I buy natives? And this is a big topic of discussion. And, and we did put in the chat and in the Q&A, um, there's some links to sites for nurseries that carry natives, um, including the Coastal Landscape Initiative site that I've put in the chat and in the Q&A a couple times. Um, Coastal Federation also has a link. I think the Native Plant Society also has a link. Does anyone have any comments or advice about that on our team? Uh, I'm always going to call your. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say I'm with the North Carolina Native Plant Society, and um, our epicenter is New Bern, and we have members from several different counties. And one of our biggest concerns was lack of access to native plants. So 
we started having a native seed swap in November and then um, our members grow out plants over the winter and spring and then we have a native plant swap for plant society members in May. So I would encourage anyone who may be interested to visit the North Carolina Native Plant Society website, um, consider joining us. Um, we're really just trying to get as many native plants out there as we can and we're hoping that our plant nurseries in the area will soon be offering um, more natives. But in the interim, we're trying to do our part to be sure that people can get their hands on native plants. Another thing is to um, let the nurseries and garden centers that uh, you frequent know what you're looking for and tell them that uh, you will be buying native plants if they're going to stock them. So I'll just add that um, that resource, you know, we do try to identify nurseries in Eastern North Carolina on that list. It's the same list, actually. That, uh, our list is the one that's on the Coastal Federation's webpage because um, we can't have the list on our, uh, on our platforms. Um, but we try to update that annually. And I think, Amy, me, you guys have a list of uh, local nurseries, too, that I don't know if it's uh, any more detailed, might be updated slightly differently than ours. Um, I know there are certainly uh, online sources. Uh, online sources are uh, unfortunately sometimes uh, more helpful. Um, and, and I'll just uh, say that, you know, sometimes, especially if you're planting a large area um, but, uh, of herbaceous plants, uh, buy plugs. Uh, they're a lot more economical. Um, you get them in and you water them. And I mean, you can plant a much larger area sometimes. It's interesting, a lot more impact. <laughs> I've started, uh, uh, I just uh, grew some seeds myself this summer with some milk jugs. Um, and I know that that's not practical on large scale, but um, just so that I can have, uh, I can plant more out. But we're also working on it. We've applied for a USDA grant um, to uh, work with uh, about 20 nurseries in Eastern North Carolina. Um, they all have not all been identified. So if you're a nursery, contact me um, if you're interested in, in trying to get more natives in the marketplace. Great, thank you. Um, how to get rid of different invasives in your yard. That's more of a how-to. And I, I think that might vary based on what the invasive is, if I'm correct. So. Anyone want to respond to that one? Well, I, well, all of us probably have some experience with it, but you clearly know that I do. Um, but I, so I, I would say, um, you know, the, depending on what it is, you start, I mean, you're going to have to dig or you're going to have to um, pull. Um, uh, there is on the plant this instead document in the back of the resources, um, there's information on where you can find uh, uh, helpful sources with this information. Actually, I think specifically it's the North Carolina Botanical Garden. They have a, a nice resource on their website um, that I encourage you to, to um, go look for. Some of it depends on, you know, uh, like, well, like it, it's not an, you won't purchase this plant, uh, but uh, Japanese stillgrass, you know, it's a plant that you wanna make sure you, you never seeds. <laughs> um, so you make sure uh, that you're not disturbing it while it's in seed. Um, if I'm rambling, I, I would go to the North Carolina Botanical Garden and look at their resource. And there, there are probably others. It's just sort of nice and concise. Rachel, are you trying to share? Are you talking to somebody else? Sorry. I can't hear you. That's all I have. Okay. Um... I, I'm trying to get through. There's a lot of there's a lot of questions. <laughs> so there I'm, are there are uh, so I I don't know if we would be able to answer all of these. Um, hopefully, I have uh, set up a Zoom such that everything's recorded and we can yeah. take a look at these and um, maybe attempt to answer some of them and get the get the answers back out to you. I'm not making yeah. any promises, but we can attempt to answer some of them and share out with you. 
Thanks. That's a good, that's a good way to respond, I think. And then just to, you know, just some of them start to get specific, like, um, you know, do deep roots help plants survive hurricanes and what to replace non-native love grass with for erosion control? And I, I think a lot of these questions probably can be answered by looking at our resources, such as um, somebody mentioned Paul Hosier's book, Seacoast Plants of the Carolinas. That's a really good reference for plants that will specifically stand up to hurricanes and and I think help erosion and those types of things. So um, there's a lot of different plants that can serve those purposes. Amy, were you going to say something? Oh, I was going to say, call your local extension office. And then call your local extension yeah. office. So they'll have um, good knowledge, um, a very you know local um, uh, plants too. Yeah, I might have also have been reading another question too. So hopefully that was the right answer, the right question. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. So, um, Gloria, it's 11. I don't know um, when you want to close this down and, and like, like you said, maybe send out written answers to some of these. You've got, I'm going to still um, have about, I don't want to yeah, keep I think, on. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, people probably have other um, obligations today. And um, we can wrap up. And I appreciate everybody. Uh, I, we were very encouraged to have the response that we did um, to the call. And I'm hoping, you know, in the future, we can we can have similar uh, events. Uh, maybe you know, if we have a good list of folks, we can even. Um, it takes a lot to put on an event, and there's a lot of stress beforehand. <laughs> but I think you know we can. Uh, we might be able to even have some more that casual conversations with larger groups um, to just get this, uh, build up the uh, community that we have in North Carolina among the uh, professionals and um, the home gardeners uh, so that we can move this ball forward. We really started to, I think, in the state. I'm excited about that. Other states are doing a lot on the sustainable landscaping uh, front. And, um, and, I, and I'm glad to see that, that, that there's so much interest um, and there's so much need. Uh, so we will continue to move forward and thank you all for what you do as well. Hopefully we can get some of these answers um, to these questions and share back out.